Hi everybody, Barb Harrison here, coming by to say hello, to let you know that my family and I are doing well. Um, I want you to know that I really miss my church family and I can't wait till we're together again. Please know that I've been praying for each one of you and I hope that you are doing well. Hopefully see you soon. Bye bye. Hey guys. hey guys! Hey from the Johnsons. Hope everybody is doing well. We miss you guys. We miss everybody. Stay safe, stay healthy. Love ya. Hello, Westminster Baptist. This is Steve Carroll coming at you uh, as I'm sequestered in my home uh, during this pandemic. Just want to let you all know that I'm missing uh, seeing each and every one of you Sunday mornings, and I'm really looking forward to uh, doing the fist bumps, doing the handshakes, and, and getting the hugs back in there once uh, we can gather back together and, and worship together. Looking forward to seeing y'all. Stay safe, stay healthy. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye.
your heart be troubled hold your head up high don't fear no evil fix your eyes on this one truth god is madly in love with you take courage hold on be strong remember where our help comes from
sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I am found, was blind, but now I see. Praise the Lord, all nations. Glorify Him, all peoples. For His faithful love to us is great. The Lord's faithfulness endures forever. Hallelujah. Let's continue to worship. Before the beginning of time With no point of reference You spoke to the dark And fleshed out the wonder of light And as you speak A hundred billion galaxies are born in the vapor of your breath the planets form if the stars were made to worship so I I can see your heart in everything you've made every burning star a signal fire sings your praises so alive so alive God of your promise you don't speak in vain no syllable empty or void you have spoken all nature and science follow the sound of your voice and as you speak a hundred billion creatures catch your breath evolving in pursuit of what you said if it all reveals your nature so alive, I can see your heart in everything you say. Every painted sky, a canvas of your grace. If creation still obeys you so
chased down my heart through all of my failure and pride. On the hill you created, the light of the world abandoned in darkness to die. And as you speak, a hundred billion failures disappear. Where you lost your life so I could find it here. If you left the grave behind you, so will I. Well, good morning, church, and for those who are connecting with us online who don't have a church home, we're thankful that you're with us. We're going to be engaging God's Word in John 14 and John 15. We're going to begin in John 14, 12. Before we go there, I want to share with you uh, that we're kind of continuing this uh, series of eternal king, which is Jesus doing between the resurrection and the return and beyond that. Uh, we've been engaging that. Well, uh, just some time, some sweet time with the Lord this week, honestly. It's just been some really good, meaningful moments with the Lord in meditation and in prayer with our God. And uh, he just kind of leading me into this place of surrendering a lot of control. Um, we plan out with our strategic leadership team uh, about a year and a half of sermons, sermon series. And most of those are just walking through books of the Bible. And so I always know what I'm going to be preaching next week. There's a little bit of, 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 of confidence in knowing what you're going to be preaching next week and just simply opening up God's word and going to it. Um, but God has got us uncomfortable in so many different ways during this season. And for me, part of that means uh, that I need to be flexible with what God is speaking to our people and what he's sharing with our people during this time. And so nothing's caught him off guard, but, but in pleading with Father and asking Father to, to show, show me what to show you and to point you to in God's word and to reveal in God's word to you. Uh, he's led me not into a new dif different series in, in essence, but instead into a continuation of, okay, so here's our eternal king. Here is what he, he is doing. How do we relate to him right now? How do we access, engage, speak with, listen to uh, this Jesus who is our creator, our atonement, our uh, advocate, our resurrected king and warrior? How do we access this king? Um, and, and, and I believe that it's through, in God's word, it's pictured as through prayer and meditation. And so what we're going to do is we're going to have a series, a uh, sermon series, focusing primarily on praying to our God, listening from him and speaking to him in this communication with the eternal king. So we're going to engage John 14, 12 uh, through verses 14, and then we're going to look at John 15. And really what I want to do is I want to come away with this main idea. After Jesus' victory, with Jesus' presence, and in Jesus' name, we can bring glory to God. So let's look at verse 12 of chapter 14. It says, Truly I tell you, the one who believes in me will also do the works that I do, and he will do even greater works than these, because I am going to the Father Whatever you ask in my name, I will do it so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. Verse 14, just let me read this again. I, if I could say anything, maybe I just need to just say this 
and, and just continue to say this. Verse 14. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. I've spent more time in prayer and communication with our people and just with in people in the city and leaders in this city and ministry leaders, nonprofit leaders, government leaders this week than I have in my entire life pleading with Father on their behalf and pleading with Father for us to be able to work in a way, not just Westminster Baptist Church, but but this organization, Love 140, that we're connected with, this city of Westminster, this county, Carroll County, and this state, and, and, and so on, and all these different things connected in together. To, but, but, but recognize this, what if we were all, and this is what is so convicting by this passage for me, what if we were all under the un- understanding that if you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. Verse 12, he says, Jesus says, Truly I tell you, the one who believes in me will also do the works that I do. And he will do even greater works than these because I am going to the Father. What a, what a fascinating thought that what Jesus did, the things that Jesus did, are promised for us to be able to do now. Now we can we can mess around with all these different concepts and theologies. We could beat around the bush, and we could we could uh, you know dive into a, a couple different questions about this thing. But but what I really want you to just kind of focus in on right now is it, is what Jesus is saying. Jesus is saying that through His Spirit and through His power, He's going to be accomplishing in you great and mighty works. So much so that he says greater works than he has done. And you might wonder, how in the world can we do greater works than what Jesus did? Well, here's the critical component to that. Jesus said that before the cross. And what we're doing right now is we are working after the cross and the resurrection, after the victory of the cross and after the victory of the resurrection, we are going to work on behalf of our Father with the power of the Spirit in us. Now. Remember, and I've pointed you to this, and I think we always have to remember this, when Jesus said to go as disciples, he is saying with all authority that he has been given and all power he has been given, he is calling us to go. And as he calls us to go, the Spirit is going with us. And I, I will continually point you to this because there is no way we can go without the power of the Spirit. And there is no way we can go without the authority of Jesus. And the authority and the power of the Spirit has come because of the cross and the resurrection. Without the cross and the resurrection, there is no Spirit living in us. It was what was accomplished so that the presence of God could live in us. And without the cross and the resurrection, there's no authority and power in us because the Spirit isn't in us. And so what Jesus accomplished on the cross was truly transformative for our lives. Because now we do not live in a, in a place where we are weak and unable to accomplish great things for the glory of God. But now, because of Jesus Christ, we can look at verse 13 and 14 and know that this is going to be accomplished. Whatever you ask in my name, I will do it so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. So, so note this down. After Jesus' victory and with Jesus' presence, and in Jesus' name, we can bring glory to God. Now, in this text, we do need to note down some critical components. Is that, that is that first, we must ask in Jesus' name. Uh, at the end of most of most prayers that I hear, and people will say something like, in Jesus' name, I pray amen, or something of that nature. But I, I want to to show you why we do that, it says in verse 13, whatever you ask in my name. And what we have to recognize is when we add that there at the end is what we're saying is we're not asking in Caesar's name. We're not asking in our own government's name. We're not asking in a name of a billionaire or a name of a large organization, which was really different and difficult for the people during this time. For them to ask anything outside of Caesar would be kind of foolish for their culture. Everything was provided by Caesar. That's why his, uh, his picture was on every single coin to, to show them that all their money and all their provision came from Caesar. So to ask anything in Jesus' name was to say that my provision doesn't come from Caesar. My provision doesn't come from organizations. My provision doesn't come from the things of this world. My provision comes from Jesus. And in Jesus' name, we can accomplish greater works than we ever thought possible. John 14, 
verses 12 through 14 are giving us this picture of asking in Jesus' name. But those things that we ask in Jesus' name are not going to bring glory to us. They're not going to bring glory to our organization. They're not going to bring glory to our family. They're not going to bring glory to our name. It says in verse 13, I will do it so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. Because the Son is the one doing the work in us. And if the Son is the one doing the work in us, the Son ought to be the one that's receiving the glory because of it. And now remember, as John 17 says, just right after this, John 17 says that the glory that Jesus is being given is being given to Father. Jesus never points all the glory to himself without first pointing it to the Father. And so as the Son glorifies the Father and we glorify the Son, we are glorifying the Father through the Son uh, we are never just glorifying the Son because the Son is always glorifying the Father. It's this beautiful part of the Trinity. So remember, this is not about your glory, and this is not even solely about the glory of Jesus. This is all about the glory of the Father because the Son is always bringing glory to the Father. And the third thing I want you to see in this verse is this, is that we must recognize that God has done the work and not us. Not only is Jesus getting the glory and Jesus doing it because we've asked in his name uh, and it's within his will, but it's also Jesus that is even doing the work. It's not even us that has done and accomplished this. So I want to show you John in John 15, 1 through 8 uh, as well, how Jesus is actually saying he's doing this and accomplishing this in us. It says, I am the true vine and my father is the gardener. Every branch in me that does not produce fruit, he removes. And he prunes every branch that produces fruit so that it will produce more fruit. You are already clean. Note this first down. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me and I in you just as a branch is unable to produce fruit by itself unless it remains on the vine. Neither, vine, neither can you unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. The one who remains in me and I in him produces much fruit. Because you can do nothing without me. If anyone does not remain in me, he is thrown aside like a branch, and he withers. They gather them, throw them into the fire, and they are burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you want, and it will be done for you. My Father is glorified by this, that you produce much fruit and prove to be my disciples. So remember the main idea is this. After Jesus' victory and with Jesus' presence and in Jesus' name, we can bring glory to God. And so focus in here, because you can see the natural connection here, right? It says uh, in verse 7, Ask whatever you want and it will be done for you, which should draw our attention back to John 14, verses 12 through 14, where it's saying, Ask in Jesus' name and it will be done for you. He's picking back up on that. And so we've kind of run this whole thread and this whole uh, concept around in John 14 and 15 to say that if you ask in Jesus' name, these things will be accomplished. Now we could take this out of, uh, of we could distort this into something that it's not saying. And so we need to be very careful that we don't do that. And so I want to show you a couple of things from this passage. The first is that those who are asking in Jesus' name are those who are in Jesus' Jesus. The word is remain or meno in Greek. It's like this abiding and remaining. Um, uh, this this it's kind of like dwelling uh, in someone's presence so so much so immensely that you become like them. I don't know if you've ever noticed in your own life, but when you hang around one person so much and when you spend so much time with them, you start talking like them and maybe acting like them and thinking like them and having a worldview that is similar to theirs. You can know what they're going to say and they can know what you're going to say. Well, it's kind of similar to what we do with Jesus. We want to know what he would say to us and we want him to know what we would say to him. We want to start to talk like him and act like him and to view the world like him and it's so it's like being best friends with somebody living with somebody in the same room we ought to know a little bit about this if you're stuck with anybody in the, during this quarantine or blessed to be with somebody during this quarantine and you know them so much and you kind of been rubbed off by them and you're starting to understand them more and more that's kind of like what we're talking about here in this passage you know Jesus so in, in intimately and so closely that you know what he's going to say and he knows what you were going to say. Because when that happens, and you're asking things in his name, in Jesus' name, then you know what he would already say to you. You know his word, and you know what he has spoken to you, and you know what he has taught you. And so you're not going to ask anything outside of what he's told you to believe and think about. 
and the way he's told you to view the world and the way he's told you to think about the things that you're asking about, the ways he uh, challenged you to want and to need. As Paul challenges us in Philippians, the way we want and need has been reversed because of the gospel. And so when we are with Christ, remaining in Christ, it changes the way that we um, ask and the way that we plead with the Father. So we remain in Jesus, but we don't just remain in Jesus. We also, it says and challenges us this, is that we remain in his word. So it's not just being so close that we know what he would say and we uh, can speak to him in a way that he knows what we feel and he knows our heart and all these good things. But it's also that he's given us the word. Like, we don't have to go out and simply just ask, like, God, give me a word. Like, he has given us his word. Word And it is good to go, God, you know, give me a fresh word. Give me something that you would uh, speak to me. But it's never going to be anything outside of what he has already spoken to us. He's never going to change his word. It's unchanging. And so if you need truth for your life, it's found in God's word right here. So look at verse 3. That's why I said note this down because it's so beautiful. It says in verse 3, you are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. So we have been cleansed by God's word already, freed and forgiven by God's word. His word has been spoken to us, and it is the word that we remain in. Jesus says in John 15 that we are abiding in his words or remaining in his words, not just in him, but in his words. So what would it look like? And this is this is a little bit different. What would it look like? I mean, we know what it looks like to be in, in the same room as another person. But what would it look like to be in the same room as another, uh, as a Bible, as a word, as something that is spoken to you, that you listen to, that you see of God's word? You may, li- you may be a person who just likes, loves to listen to God's word or, or whatever it may be. But, but what does it look like to remain in his word, in his challenge uh, in the word, in those things, that those promises and those truths that we have in his word, but also those, those compellings and those uh, convictions that we find in his word. What does it look like to remain in those things? Because that, those are what are, are central for us to get to this point where we can say, ask whatever you want and it will be done for you. And this is why verse 7 says, if you remain in me and my words remain in you. If. If not, then don't do this. But if you remain in Christ, and if you remain in Christ's words, ask whatever you want, and it will be done for you. And so it's important to see John 14 and John 15 together, because what we see is, it's not only simply that we are remaining in Jesus, but but we are remaining in Jesus, and His words are remaining us, so that it comes together, and when we pray, we are praying in alignment with who Jesus is, with what Jesus has said, and our prayers come out in a way that then it brings glory to God. So John 14 and John 15 come together beautifully in these moments. In John 15, 7, if you remain in me, if, guys, if you are not remaining in Christ during this time, if you're not abiding in his word, man, let me just, let me just challenge you. Uh, I'm, I'm going to give you a, a challenge here, a really practical challenge to do. But let me, let me just give you this, man. Uh, if you're praying to the Lord and you're asking him for these things, but you're not pursuing the Lord and you don't know his heart, I mean, I, I would really challenge you. It's kind of like if you're in a relationship, uh, maybe a marriage. I'm, I'm married to get a, a wonderful wife. Today's her 30th birthday. And so I, I love her. Uh, we have this intimate relationship of a connection with, with she knows what I think and I know what she thinks. And it's this beautiful relationship, communicating to each other what we think and feel and, and love about each other and know about each other. And I love her dearly. And so when you when you think about John 15, 7 with God, I, I want you to think about this. If I just ask my wife for things, but I don't know her, and I don't know how she thinks and how she acts and what she wants and who she is, man, I'm going to miss it every time I ask for something. She'll eventually just become somebody that I'm, I'm seeking things from versus enjoying and loving. And, and if we do that with Father, what we're going to do is we're just, G, God's going to become like a little genie box, a genie in a bottle or whatever you call those things. It's just, you're just asking him for a wish. I mean, that's just not our God. And if anything coming from this series, Eternal King, we ought to know that that's not our king. Our king's the one that's advocating on our, our behalf. He's the one that came into this world to die for you on the cross. You think he's going to settle for you just talking to him every now and then when you want something? It's not my God. 
It's not what he came on this earth to die for. He didn't come to die on, on the earth to get in a bottle and become your genie. He came on, to die on this earth to come back into this earth and to live with you forever. As your king, as the warrior king, the lion, and the lamb. That's my God. And he wants a relationship with you. He desires it. It says he desires a relationship with all people. And desires that none would perish. So as we close this morning, I, w- I want to just simply lead you into a time of prayer. Um, and just just reflecting on God's word, and so I'm gonna I'm gonna give you some ways to do this, and then just let you go. Um, so really practically, here's here's what I want to challenge you to do. I want you to spend time asking God, meditating on God's word, and producing good works for the Lord. And no work is ever done without the power of the Spirit and God working in us. So I'm not asking you to go do good works to prove your righteousness. I'm saying that when you are pleading with the Father to work in you and meditating on His Word, He's going to challenge you to go do something. Just get in His Word and see what He calls you to do. Okay, so asking, that's that Jesus is listening. Meditating, that is that Jesus is speaking to you. And then go produce some good works. That is that Jesus is working in you. So here's how we're going to practically do that. I just want you to spend some time. First, uh, spend some time in prayer asking that God would reveal truth to you during this time. Uh, God, would you speak to me? God, would you challenge me? Would you convict me or compel me into a different way of thinking or acting? The second is I want you to spend some time in Psalm 37. Would you just read the chapter and then pick out a verse or two, maybe a stanza of Psalm 37, and I want you to say it ten times out loud. Uh, You can say it out loud if you're comfortable with it. If you're really uncomfortable with that, you can say it in your um, in your head and just repeat it 10 times. By the 10th time, you might not have it memorized, but you've at least kind of got an idea of what it says. After this, contemplate it. So that's, you're thinking about it. I like to think about it kind of like um, my daughter loves Play-Doh and we build with Legos all the time. And it's really just like I, I can build up. I can, I can just sit there and mold things with my hands. And I, I actually really enjoy this with her because we create these amazing things out of this stuff. But, but when you take God's word and you really dig into it and ask, what is this saying to me? What is this saying about me and what is this saying about God? It's like you're building up an entire way of viewing yourself and viewing God that is from God's word. And I just love it. It's, it's building, always building up this beautiful picture of who God is and who I am. So memorize it, contemplate it, and then finally express it. And so what that looks like is, for you, it may be different. But for a lot of people, they like to journal. And I would love to see you journaling God's Word, Psalm 37, maybe a stanza or a verse of it. Um, some people like to sing. I love it, man. Write a song. This is one of my favorite ways of um, worshiping the Lord, is writing a song out to Him. Uh, maybe for you, you're creative and you like to draw. Uh, draw the verse and draw what it means to you and how it impacts you and your view of God. Um, maybe for you it's through dance or through some other form of art. It doesn't matter. What matters is taking that truth and really making it something that you can understand and express yourself. Because once you can express it, you truly kind of know it and it's become part of who you are. So finally, after that, after you've prayed that God would reveal the truth to you and you've meditated on, his, on God's Word and really truly sat in these verses and let them kind of sink into you. Uh, the way I, I, I think about meditation, and many people know this, is that uh, it's like a fire that warms you. Uh, that we sit at the fire of God's Word and let it warm our hearts into what He is for us and He has about us and about Himself in God's Word. And after that, uh, I would challenge you to... Um, let God's word move into action. What does this mean for you? What does this mean for your family, your spouse, your kids, your, uh, your parents? What does this mean for your friends for this time of quarantine? How does this actually apply in your life today? And I love what some, some authors say about um, prayer and meditation. Uh, when you pray and you meditate, it always leads you back into prayer. Um, when you at the end of this time, I would just, I just want to encourage you. I'm not going to break down um, some like uh, logistics or uh, give you strategies for prayer this morning. Uh, we're going to walk through that for the next few weeks. But what I want to do this morning is I just want to, I want you to just spend some time with the Lord. 
And so if you feel really uncomfortable with prayer and if you just feel like you haven't done it in a long time or you maybe have said, man, I haven't been really centered on God's word and on who he is. I've been really kind of doing my own thing in my prayer life. Would you just, just focus in on this? What you've meditated on and what God's challenged you to do, just ask that God would do that in you. It's just simple prayer time. Ask that God would do what he said in his word in your life. What would he accomplish in you? Because he says, ask in my name and he will do it. So let's center our hearts on his word and on his will. And let's pray that God would accomplish that in us. I love you guys. I'm so thankful to be your pastor. And I pray that these are some sweet moments this week as you spend time in prayer and meditation.